Mm-hmm. And I'm watching, um, where the hell is it? Hold on. Welcome to this live broadcast from True Fire Studios Remote. Um, we've got a great, great show for you today. Three of my very favorite people, Adam Levy, Mimi Fox, and Sue Ham. Uh, we're going to chat with them. They're going to play music. We may pick up some teaching bits. Um, so grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy um, you're watching Adam Levy, who is one of my very, very, very favorite people on the planet. Um, Adam, you and I go way back, man, way back. Uh, we started working together, God, you know, I think early 90s. You were only seven or eight years old. Um, and uh, you, were, you were working at Guitar Player Magazine doing a, a lot of their, you know, uh, articles and lessons and um, I was amazed at the guitar work and the teaching acumen and your musicality and just you know really everything about you and I think we bonded r really well and then all of a sudden I hear boom Nora Jones out on the road writing records and uh, you just exploded on the scene man and today without a doubt one of my personal favorite singer-songwriters, personal, you know, favorite performers, and, uh, you know, your courses here at True Fire are, you know, in incredible. So how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a good day. Yeah, well, looks like you have some sunshine out there in California. Yeah, it's amazing. This spring has gotten off to a really funny start. For a couple of weeks, it was like rainy one day, sunny one day, rainy one day, sunny one day. And I know there's a lot of parts of the world where maybe that's just what spring is like, but um, California tends to swing, especially Southern California, one way or the other. And so we had a couple of weeks of, of you just never knew in the morning if you were going to need a sweater or a rain jacket or <laughs> shorts. But I think we're in it now. I think I think we're really in the springtime. It's beautiful. Well, we could all certainly use a little springtime, and hopefully we'll be able to get outside, back to the beach, back to the parks, back to the mountains, and yeah. uh, enjoy it. But I'm thrilled you're safe, you're sound, you're healthy. I, I love your shirt. I need, <laughs> you to send, I need you to send that to me when we're done here. Okay. Um, 
so um, what what do you want to do for our little show together here? I hope you, you're going to play some music for us. I'm definitely going to play some music. Um, yeah, I'd love to play some music. Uh, I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about my channel, uh, Right Brain Guitar. Um, if I can get in a little plug for a, a record I put out this year that's a, a live, live in a club record. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, to, to teach something if, if people have questions or if you have a question or, you know. You know, I always hit you up with questions. That That's you, true. Usually stupid questions, but you don't make me feel stupid. You answer them anyway. Um, let me quickly do a little housekeeping here and uh, thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, we certainly hope you are all safe and sound wherever you happen to be in the world. And, and we'd love to hear where you happen to be. You know, we like you to shout out, tell us where you're tuned in from. And um, we'll shout out back to you. Um, also, you'll notice underneath the video, there are some things you can do. Um, probably, uh, um, you know, very importantly, there's a tip jar. We don't normally do that in our live broadcast, but it's uh, particularly important during these times, as I'm sure it's not lost on anyone that artists can't gig, they can't tour, the, many of them can't even get into the studio and record. Um, so anything that you can do to support the cause, 100% of those tips go to the artist. You know, a dollar even is a very helpful thing. Um, there's also a thumbs up. Um, and if you click that thumbs up, it's a great way to show your love, um, show your appreciation for the artist taking, you know, their time to do this for you and for us. And um, it, it helps to spread that love. So without further ado, Adam, play us something, man. Okay. I will. Um, let's see. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Very nice, man. Is that off of the latest record or? No. Um, it's on two records, actually. Um, not my most recent record, but on my two just prior to that. Uh, the song is called Blueberry Blonde. It's from an EP that I made that's called Blueberry Blonde. Uh, and it's also on a on a full length record that I made with uh, Mason Stoops, who's a great guitar player that people out there may know. And you probably know. Uh, we we recorded a version of that on our duet record that came out last year. It's called uh, Kibby Dango. Is the name of the record. What um, you know that intro video? Who was that you were playing with there? Uh, that is a great uh, singer songwriter from Australia named Heath Cullen. Uh, Heath and I met a few years ago in Los Angeles and subsequently have done some touring. I went to Australia a couple of years ago and, and did a tour with Heath. Uh, great singer songwriter, great guitar player. He has a new record uh, that's out. Uh, it's called Springtime of the Heart. And uh, I played guitar on that record. So you, what always, I mean, it just amazes me. You always seem to have two or three or more projects happening simultaneously. You do a ton of co-writing. Um, you're the, you're like, <laughs> I don't know if this is a compliment or not, but you're like the Kevin Bacon of the music singer song, <laughs> you know? Everybody I know knows you or it knows somebody that has collaborated with you. So um, mm, I'll take that. That's it, it's just amazing. And, you know, you know, we've embraced the singer songwriter category here at True Fire. And the first person that we called to say, hey, man, other than yourself, who do you think we should shout out to and do some work with? And you know, your, your referrals are always just so spot on. What's the latest project or projects you're working on right now? Uh, let's see. Well, the latest thing that's actually out that people could hear is a live record. Um, it's not a songwriter record. It's an instrumental jazz, folk jazz, maybe, um, record. I recorded it last year in a small club in L.A., a friend of mine had this has this reel to reel tape deck and homemade um, compressor preamp, and he he said, "Hey, could I show up at your gig and record? It'll be really unobtrusive. It'll be real simple." And he did, and it came out great. It, we played two sets, and um, when I heard the whole thing, I thought, "Well, it's, maybe it's not all stuff I'd want to release, but there's definitely a record's worth of stuff there." And then I sat on it for a bit. And then when everything happened, you know, with this uh, pandemic, I thought, wow, people, yeah, there it is. It's called California Special. Mm. Like suddenly the idea of listening to live jazz in a small club is, um, is seems like a, a very magical thing, you know, that, um, so I, I, it made me more, even more excited to release that record because I wanted, it really feels like you're in the club. There, you hear people talking and shouting and, um, and, and it was a very spontaneous record. So that's the, the latest thing that's out in the world that people can hear. Um, songwriting wise, I've been a little slow in my songwriting this year, but I, I have been doing collaborative things. If people follow me on Instagram, my, my handle on Instagram is string juggler. And I've done a bunch of collaborative, remote collaborations with people. Uh, there's a guitar player named Justin Smith, who I've done a couple of neat things with. Uh, there's an old friend, Joao Herbeta in Brazil. Uh, we did a, a duo together. So those are, th those things that you can see now are like the things I've been doing just in the last few weeks. It's this whole <laughs> kind of change of scenery. Um, and then I'm working on a solo guitar record, but at the moment, that's kind of just, I'm working on it in my mind. I, I can't go to a studio, as you said. I can't get together with my producer and have coffee and talk about stuff. So it's just sort of a an idea, but that'll be the next thing that I'll 
be ready to release into the world. I wanted to do one more record with no singing and at the same time be gathering songs and writing songs and uh, share that maybe next year. Cool. How about another tune for us? Sure. Uh, you want me to play something with backing or you want to? Uh, Let, yeah, live? let's do a backing track one. Great. Okay. Sure. You let me know how the balance is. Okay, Tommy, that's your department. <laughs> Tommy, can we show Adam's catalog? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that tune was in uh, the Take Five lyrical soloing. Is that right, Adam? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Cool. Yeah, and you know that tune took me back to the. Remember the first session we did? It was in Nashville. Um, uh -huh. We did it at, at SIR. Uh, oh, yeah. Slow burn soloing. Show show that one, if you would. And a man, I'll tell you, that was incredible. Um, mm. You know, the thing with Adam is uh, his whole approach to soloing, from from our perspective, and certainly from my personal perspective, is you know it's so melodic, it's so lyrical. Every note, you know, means something. You know, it's so tasty. And, for, you know, for someone like myself, I'm, you know, I certainly can't even come close to blazing on, you know, fretboard pyrotechnics. But, 
you know, what you taught me was you can say a lot with just a few notes, you know, and uh, slow burn soloing kicked off, I, I think, a pretty incredible catalog of stuff that we've done together. The uh, mm -hmm. lyrical soloing, talk, talk a little bit about that course. Remember? Do you yeah. remember that course? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Um, yeah, in that course, I really wanted to talk about making music with the materials you know we all have the same materials there's not some secret scale that that you know the great players are using you know we're all just basically riffing on pentatonics and major scales and 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 like that so it's 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 not about access to materials as much as what you do once once you have them in your hands and so i really wanted to have an emphasis on uh, on playing lyrically and thinking like a lyricist even if you're not a songwriter some some of you may be but i really do think about words when i'm playing and think about um, uh, poetry and that helps shape the notes so that a note isn't just well you know, I'll, I'll play this note because it's the one that comes after this note in the scale and giving everything equal weight, but actually thinking about it more uh, as a language. So that's that's really what that course is about. Over the course of five uh, composed solos, uh, I showed different aspects of that and, and they all really boil down to that. Yeah, thinking, uh, communicating through what you play rather than just running scales top to bottom. So we have a question. Um, perfect oh. segue to this question from Brogue 3D. Uh, okay. He says, I have one for Adam. What is your approach when looking for a melody? Let's say a standard blues. How do you do what you just did? Where do you find the road to a different melody? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, let's see. One thing you could do is put the guitar down for a minute and just listen to the backing track. Um, and hopefully melodies come into your, your imagination, uh, without needing the guitar in your hand. If you need the guitar in your hand, you may be just falling into patterns. Um, and, pa and patterns have value. I mean, if we want to get any kind of uh, momentum going, we need, we need to be able to play without thinking too much. So, so those, kind of, those patterns can be useful. But the first place I would go to look for a melody over a, a slow blues or something would be absent the guitar. And then once I've got an idea in my head, pick up the guitar and, 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 and try to capture the essence of what I'm hearing in my imagination on the fretboard. Uh, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you're on the gig and you just gotta start playing something. <laughs> um, so I might think of a, of a poem or a line from a poem. Um, I'm just looking around the room. I don't have a poem here, but what do I have? Uh, even if, okay, something really simple. Uh, true fire, just by thinking about that, sometimes I'll, that'll spark something. Can I make the sound of true fire on my guitar? True fire. So all the, it means that all of my phrases are going to be kind of short because that's not a poem. It's just a, it's just two words, but it might lead me to something. Uh, and I've got a, some other kind of tricks up my sleeve when I feel really stuck. Sometimes I'll just force myself to play on one string for a while. So again, I'm, I don't have any patterns to fall into. I've just got to 
find one note at a time and, and make the music happen one note at a time. You, you'll develop your own tricks, but as you do, or either you learn them from somebody else or you discover them, write them down because you'll need to, you'll always <laughs> have moments where you, you, the music's not coming to you. And sometimes just, you know, putting your shoes on opposite feet or finding some, some way to, to, to get yourself in a different zone can be the source of, of some new ideas. I, um, uh, I remember in lyrical soloing, there was one insight that was like this big epiphany for me anyway, and okay. I'm sure for many people where you talked about when you were constructing, you know, a line, a lyrical line, you were thinking very much like a vocalist. And I remember mm -hmm. you saying, you know, guitar players tend to see the whole neck and all the different octaves and, you know, one note should lead to another note. And you said, look, at, if you think about how vocalists sing, they're usually sticking within an octave. Um, they are repeating notes a lot. Um, there's not a lot of, let's say, blazing fretboard work happening. And, um, and we all love a great melody, uh, a great singer. And talk, talk to that a little bit. You, you recall that lesson in lyrical solo? I do. See, this is, this is why conversations uh, like this are, are so valuable, like to be reminded of things that you, that you know, but that you forget that you know. <laughs> um, yeah. There, there's this impulse when you're learning the guitar, like, oh, okay, I've learned the five pentatonics. Now I want to connect them all. I want to see the whole thing so I can just run all over the place. And but that's great. But Brad, as you said, when you listen to great singers or any singers, really, they're not running all over two or three or four octaves all the time. A vocal melody of a song is probably living in just one zone, you know, like uh, I'm not going to play a, a, a song here, but maybe I'll just play. I'll just play. Uh, can I play happy birthday? Yes, you can. <laughs> okay. It's somebody's birthday. <laughs> that whole thing lives within an octave and think of like all of the times that just that much has made you laugh or cry or, or feel something. Um, and that's really all that octave space is really all you need. So I, I'm going to go back and, and play over the jam that I just played just for, just for a short bit and show you what that looks like when, when you apply that kind of, um, approach. So here's my octave. I, I was able to communicate something there that uh, was well, just within an octave. I never went below this A or above this A. And, and I wasn't afraid to repeat a phrase. I mean, that's really elements of music. Music, most of the music that we love, music that we grew up with, music that's on the radio, repetition is, is part of it and limitation is part of it. So the idea that you need to run all over the place to make music is just something that, it, 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 it's an understandable impulse. It's athletic, but it's, it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily lead to music. 
Yeah, it's um, you're so spot on there. That was a great uh, musical illustration of what you're talking about. But, you know, all of us guitar players were kind of, you know, trained to play a lot of notes as fast as we can. And, you know, and that's not necessarily musical. Um, Adam, really, uh, let me just do a quick station break here. We have a trivia question. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask that question right now. We're giving away $300 TrueFire gift cards, good as gold on TrueFire. And wow. the uh, trivia question for you, I hope you know the answer to this, okay? okay. Which well-known Christmas song did Adam's grandfather, George Weil, did I pronounce that right? Is it Weil or Wiley? Weil. George Weil, right. What well-known Christmas song did Adam's grandfather, George Weil, write? I answer know. that. Don't, don't, don't answer that in the chat. Don't give away the answer. There's a link underneath the YouTube video. Click that, answer it there, and we're going to randomly select a, a, a winner and give you a $100 gift card. And we're going to do another trivia. We're going to do two more of them. So there's you have three shots at winning one of these. Um, what I also want you to talk about is a Right Brain Guitar, your channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I started that maybe a year ago, and uh, I wanted to bring together the things that I'm uh, into, the things that I'm passionate about. So it's a little bit about guitar playing, and also it's a little bit about songwriting. So uh, what I've done there is I've built a library of uh well, there's performance videos, as you can see there. That's a, a live performance or a live in in in, in my friend's house uh, performance video. It makes me nostalgic to see people together in a room making music. Uh, <laughs> I know, bizarre. So there's a performance library, which is uh, just lots of performances of songs and instrumental stuff. There's interviews with songwriters. Uh, that's in a section called Word for Word. Uh, there's also in that same uh, folder, besides interviewing songwriters, I've also done a couple of interviews with fellow guitar players who who play with singer-songwriters a lot and have some insights there. Uh, there's a bunch of complete songs to play. There's a bunch of little short phrases that might inspire you. Um, there's a section called Harmony 2.0. Uh, wow, that's such a trip because I'm in the same room, <laughs> but that's that's tripping <laughs> <out>. inception <laughs> mm -hmm. um uh yeah so it's the channel is for people who write songs and for people who play guitar there's a lot of overlap there it's also for people who play guitar with songwriters people who've been writing songs for a while or people who are curious to get started you can learn about harmony you can learn uh the kind of fundamentals of the form uh, there's some challenges, um, and there's new content there every month. I'm always posting new stuff um, and, and trying to try and keep it varietal so that there's stuff about open tuning, stuff about using capos, stuff about expanding your palette of harmony and so on. Um, the channel really is in incredible. This is, um, you'll, you, you see it, you know, we, we showed you this, there's a link in the chat to it, but it is, uh, you know, and particularly your channel, man. I mean, it's so much cool stuff, um, mm -hmm. that you don't get to see or hear and mm -hmm. you get a full flavor of, you know, the artist, Adam Levy up kind of up close and personal. We mm -hmm. have, um, I was actually surprised to learn how many singer songwriters we have in our, you know, guitar and bass playing community. Mm. And, um, you know, whether you're interested in, you know, more guitar stuff, or especially if you're interested in uh, learning more about the art and craft of uh, songwriting, um, what's the subscription to it, Adam, of, of first level? Uh, first level is, is $10 a month. Okay. Worth every penny. And I can think of no better time than all the time we now have at home 
to, you know, dig in deep here. Give it a go. I guarantee you, you will dig this thing. And also a phenomenal oh, way to, uh, you know, to, to support, uh, you know, all of the artists during these times. Um, yeah. How about another tune for us, man? Sure. Um, I'll do another play along here. Um, let's see. Yeah, run down. What is that? Uh, this is a 1979 Gibson ES335 TD. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I'm the original owner. I got it in 1979 for my bar mitzvah present from my dad. <laughs> uh, it was felt so big, I could barely get myself around it. Uh, but it was my first professional guitar, and I don't know if you can see it. I've worn yes, all the you have. The neck. You've um, done some slow burn soloing on that one, huh? <laughs> the guitar I played uh, with when I was in Tracy Chapman's band. This is the guitar I had for the first Nora Jones record. Uh, my first couple of records that I made, Blue uh, Buttermilk Channel. Um, for a long time, this this was this was the guitar. This is all I had, so I played the daylights out of it. It's beautiful. Um, listen, man, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you 
taking the time to share your music and your insight with us. I want everybody to know the following. One is check out that channel, Right Brain Guitar, the links in the chat. Um, check out all of Adam's courses. Um, we've got a ton of them on sale right now. Um, uh, we're doing a, kind of a month long promotion. We get that folks are a little hard pressed financially, and we are doing our best to be able to get this into your hands uh, very affordably. The most recent album, California Special, we put that link in there as well. Check out Lyrical Soloing. I've had so many epiphanies from that course. And mm -hmm. Adam, you're doing a weekly streaming show on Stage It, right? That's right, every Sunday. Uh, every Sunday at what time? 3.30 uh, Pacific time. That's my time zone. 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. Awesome. And I think you have it up on our big public uh, show calendar, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. If, if people can't find it there, it's uh, stageit.com slash string juggler. Beautiful. Um, I, I see here through the magic of the technology that Tommy has whipped together for us that we have Mimi Fox standing by for the next segment. Any way you can Woo! get these guys to talk to each other, Tommy? Uh I'll work on that. Give me just one second. But yeah. Okay. Um, you. There are no degrees of separation between you and Mimi, right? You guys no. have known each other for a long time. Yeah, um, almost 30 years. <laughs> um, so you were just toddlers, apparently, right? When, <laughs> when, you, first, <laughs> when you first met. Um, but, uh, she is really incredible. Um, I'll, I'll never forget when she came in, this was way back in the beginning of true fire. Um, and we did jazz anatomy, which was a very risky thing for Mimi to do. Number one, because who the heck were we, you know, all this newfangled streaming, technical, digital stuff and, you know, and jazz and, and, and to do a jazz course as well was kind of. But man, that went number one with a bullet, didn't it, Mimi? I don't know if we can hear you or if you can hear me. I can hear you. Tommy, can the audience hear Mimi? I'm bringing Mimi on right now. Hang on. Um, so, but Adam, share your thoughts about Mimi Fox. Why don't you intro her, in fact? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard Mimi... We met uh, teaching at a, guitar, a summer guitar workshop in, I think, 91 in San Rafael. Does that sound right, Mimi? That sounds about right, Adam. Yeah, yeah. So that's like 30 years, and I had just never heard anybody play jazz guitar with that much fire, ever. And as I got to know her, I was amazed and inspired by the fact that she could play bebop that way but also was interested in all kinds of other stuff uh, acoustic guitar uh kind of folky acoustic guitar things and i know as a producer she's she's produced things that, that aren't jazz or even really guitar oriented at all so she's she really is a big picture musical person a thoughtful person and just a complete badass of a guitar player. And uh, just before all this happened, we were actually talking about trying to do some live shows. Together. I'm heartbroken that, that, they, that they'll be postponed, but I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing a stage uh, with Mimi when, when the time comes. Adam, and can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. We can. I just want to say thank you, Adam. You are you are as ever a mensch, and um, I'm surrounded by menches in my <laughs> life. You and Brad are, are two of my favorite people uh, and menches. But um, Adam, you know, here's to the next uh, thirty years of our friendship, and uh, hopefully, we'll have many more shows, uh, you know, to do together and to share. Yes. Adam, thank you so much, man. We'll talk to you soon. Really appreciate you uh, you hanging with us for the past hour or so. And, and, and send me that shirt. Okay, thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you later, man. 
Mimi Fox, how are you? I am okay. Um, I still see Adam there. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm just looking on to see where I am. And um, I want to be sure Tommy and I worked on this. I want to be sure I'm placed right. Uh, <laughs> Look good. Looking Look okay? Good. Look at that headstock. I <laughs> love it. Yeah, you you look great. You sound well, great. You I, I can from my thing, it looks like the top of my head is cut off, but that's um the top of my head has always been kind of overrated. And so yeah. I'm yeah, they, happy. they tend to cut off the top of my head as well, which considering it's largely gray, doesn't bother me in the least. Okay. Uh, well, I hear you, bro. Believe me. I, so, I you. Uh, you know, um, you know, I had mentioned our first project together back in the prehistoric age of True Fire was Jazz Anatomy. And neither one of us kind of, you know, like, hey, how's this going to go over? And remember, we'd call each other almost every week and say, oh, my God, look at this. You know, we we did really well. The response to that course, you know, to this day, that course is still one of our most popular. You were. What do you tell me? Rem, tell people about that experience way back when. Oh gosh, uh, we talked about this, Fred, so, a, a little bit during the the first True Fire Live we did when I did my last courses in St. Pete with you. But um, it was a pretty extraordinary experience because every. Just Mamie, hang on. Let's see. Bye, guys. You're back. Am I back? Okay. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is that um, it was very low tech, uh, you know, it, by today's standards, Brad, everything, everything from the fact that your wonderful um, chocolate lab buddy was curled up next to my feet for the entire two days that we recorded that course uh, to all the, the cameras and stuff. I mean, it was just all a very, and you were sort of, you and I were sort of doing everything. And if I would get too off on a, you know, tangent, you'd say to me basically very politely, meme, English, English, <laughs> uh, make this understandable. And uh, so I feel like it was like a child we had if, in a way, right? It was like a birth uh, for that first course, but there was something I don't know. I, I feel like it had something special. And I think it was the combination of you and me working together for the first time. It felt very magical to me. Hello? Brad. You lose yes. Brad. Now I see yeah. Brad is frozen. Tommy, think, can you hear me? I got gotcha. you. Brad, you there? I can't. I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay. Are you hearing Mimi? Nope. I can't hear Brad now. I don't. Um, okay. Hang on. Let's reload this thing quickly. All right. Brad, are you able to hear Mimi now? Yeah, try signing out and then signing back in. Let's try that. Let's see if that works. Sorry, guys. Stand by. Live show.
Okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Brad, go ahead. Take it away. Okay. Well, okay. As someone said in the chat, there was a glitch in the matrix, but we're <laughs> back at you. Mimi, let's play something. Let's do that. What do okay. you have for us? Oh, um, I got, I've been looking through different uh, possibilities. I, um, I think I'll play... I think I'll play a really cool Bobby Timmons piece called Monin. Uh, and it's kind of a real spiritual kind of blues, really hip lyrics and a uh, hip piece. And uh, this is my arrangement of it. Um, and I think with everything everyone's going through now, uh, Monin is, a, is an appropriate <laughs> title. <laughs> I, I agree that. I see, what I, I see what I come up with. Cool.
C19 doesn't have anything on you, does it? <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, how's, how's your day-to-day -day going over there? How are you spending your time? You know, um, it is, um, it's been interesting. I mean, this spring I had a number of really cool uh, tour things cancel, including um, I was going to be the guest soloist with the Michigan Philharmonic. And oh. I had been working on that music for like, oh gosh, several months. And um, uh, so I'm, and I had arranged some of my original pieces for chamber orchestra. So, uh, you know, that, that's that been a bummer. And I was also supposed to go to Mexico to record with this great vocalist there and do some shows. So a lot of, and a whole bunch of other things too. But, um, you know, I'm using this time, I'm composing, I'm recording in my home studio. Uh, I've been trying to do a lot of uh, live stream concerts through Facebook to my friends and fans and just, uh, you know, just stay engaged. Yeah, I, I, it's um, me, uh, Adam and I were talking about how, I, you know, one way or another, the music stays alive and artists, while they can't get out and record or gig or do their festivals and tours, are making good use of the time at home to still, you know, work on their music. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, the kind of what comes out the other side of this, given you guys have all this time to spend composing and fiddling around. What did you lose your pick inside your guitar? Actually, now? you know, just, just on account of, <laughs> This happened to me once uh, several years ago. My pick guard, it's held on in a strange way. And uh, anyway, it just sort of fell off. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to just get rid I'm just going to take the whole thing off right now. I'll, I'll adjust it later. Uh, but given that we've had some technological glitches, I think it's perfect yeah, that we've now know. had, I now know. that we've now that my guitar, which is a beauty, just decides to, be, you know, to act up to. I think it didn't want to be lonely. No, I, I know. It, my, my granddaughter, whenever she comes to visit, um, sticks all kinds of small objects inside uh, the F halls of all my guitars. So you pick it up Perfect, and right? you start rattling it to see what comes out. And, you know, it could be anything from, you know, uh, grapes to small coins to anything she oh, can stick in that hole. Anything. You might find an old treasure map from, you know, some pirate in the, you know, 18th century. You don't know what's going to come out of your guitar. I should be so lucky, you know. Um, <laughs> while we're talking about the guitar, why don't you tell everyone about the guitar, if you would? Well, this is this is the uh, signature model. Um, actually, um, yeah, this is there. You can see my name on the headstock. That's the only reason to learn how to play the guitar is so you can get your name on the guitar. Um, no, seriously. Um, this, this I mean, that's got to feel good, though. Come on. That's, you know, great, when Heritage right? out, I had been with Heritage since 91. And when they rolled out the signature model, it was pretty cool. It was in conjunction with their uh, 30th anniversary. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's special. And I'm, you know, it's I love the guitar. Spruce top, um, ebony fingerboard, everything just flows really well. And uh, despite <laughs> despite the little problem with the pickup today, it's, it's been a great it's been a great guitar, and uh, you know the the original builders uh, from Heritage are great guys. So um, I'm you know I love this axe. Very cool. We have for you also a trivia question, which I hope you know the answer to. Okay. And um, we're going to give away a hundred dollar gift card to, uh, you know, we'll randomly pick people who answer these correctly. The trivia question for Mimi Fox is how old was Mimi when she started playing the guitar? And hint, by the way, on all these trivia questions, you'll find it on Mimi's and Adam and Stu's website. How old was Mimi when she started playing guitar? Answer that, not in the thread, please. Click the link underneath the video. Answer it in the form there. And while you're hanging out underneath the video, do you see that thumbs up? Please click that thumbs up. Great way to show your love, spread the love, and uh, express our appreciation for these, you know, incredible artists and good friends of mine. Um, for sharing their time and their talent with us. How about another tune, Memes? Can you play one yeah. without the guitar? No, I think, 
yeah, sure. Um, I'm actually thinking I might want to pick up my baritone uh, because I, my last project was all acoustic. Um, as you know, I did, and I am a Taylor endorser for all of yeah. my acoustic guitars, and I have this really funky baritone, so I might want to, uh, although that is, that's, uh, maybe I'll stay on this one. I'll say we'll probably, now that uh, we've got the technology back up, we'll stay on for a bit. So Okay, um, but let's not forget the baritone we've got to we've yeah. got to do a tune on that okay yeah well now i gave people a little bit of a tease so. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah so let's see what are you going to play for us i'm going to play um a standard one of my favorite uh, jazz standards uh have you met miss jones so I'll do beautiful that. thank you thank you for having me brad <laughs>
I love it. You know what? It reminded me because, you know, you, I'm always mesmerized when you play. Do you remember we did, we filmed, uh, you brought your trio to St. Petersburg, which was yes. a rare treat for us. And um, we organized, you know, a production team to go out there and shoot the concert. And they mistakenly assigned me one of the cameras, right? <laughs> so I'm supposed to be running the camera, but I'm watching you play. And uh, uh, suffice to say, my camera seemed to drift a little bit from here. Oh, there it is. It looks like it's up on the screen. There's some it of was, the... Yeah. It was... That was incredible. And we wound up making a course out of that called, uh, I think, Jazz Performance, right? Yep. Yeah, Jazz Performance. Here, let's let's play a little bit of it for everyone. Okay, cool. There it is. <laughs> Cool. Tommy, show um, show the uh, course, if you would. Yeah, yeah. There so we shot we shot the entire set. Here, can can you shut down the video? There you go. So Mimi, we we yeah. shot the entire uh, set. And then uh, you came back and kind of analyzed the things that you were doing and why you were doing it. Then you actually taught a lot of the parts. We transcribed everything. You did a spectacular interview. Remember the interview? It was just great. Well, I, and, you know what? I'm gonna correct you. We did a spectacular interview because part of the reason <laughs> that it was so good is because you were asking me not, um, you know, not these kind of run of the mill questions, Brad. You really asked me some good questions and that inspired me. And also um, you gave me the option of looking at the responses ahead of time, but I chose not to because I thought that would make it more spontaneous, which is more like jazz. And, and it was spontaneous. I remember one of the uh, kind of key insights from that interview was, and you could talk to this about how, um, a jazz artist, and it probably applies to, you know, any musician, you know, you study, 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 and then you forget all that when you get on stage. Talk to that a little bit, would you? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's, it's funny. It's something that I talk to uh, my conservatory students about all the time, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, it's super important to, um, to be able to, internalize all the information that you learn. And this, you know, this happens from years of study, of course, but you internalize it and then it becomes a part of you. And then when you're actually on the bandstand, when you're actually playing in a live situation, it's it's just a part of you. Um, and you don't have to think about it, it has to become intuitive, second nature, so that in the playing situation, you can just play. Yeah, it was, it was just great. Tommy, show the catalog, show Mimi's catalog. It kind of, this catalog like traces our history together, you know? It's, it does, it does, uh, yeah. You know, it was David Wish who introduced you to Ali and myself at that NAM show. There was this yeah. like instant connection. And even though we were talking all this back in the day, no one was really doing this kind of stuff. And you said, sure, hey, let's do it, you know? So we did, there's Jazz Anatomy. You can see that course, that's our first course. Um, just to this day, I think a hundred years from now, this course will be a seminal jazz course. Um, here, can you just stay on the catalog, please? There just it is. Go through. So we, you, you, you took a two five one minor, two five one major. We did a modal. We did a blues. Um, we did one other style. I can't remember, but you would. Uh, you taught us how to comp it. You taught oh, us how to solo over it. That's Go right. Ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say um, you know, the whole thing was really about um, just sort of breaking things down in a way that I felt like would be understood really clearly by students. I mean, you know, as an educator or professor, you know, you always want to do that. You always want to be really 
making things clear for people. And that's, you know, super important. So, um, you know, but I feel like by taking just these five different things that we took, um, you know, we really focused in on them and, and broke them down. And then we followed that up with graduated solos, which took the whole soloing thing to a whole other level. Um, then did we do flying solo right after that? Yes, or flying we- solo was the third course of all about solo guitar playing. Okay, then we and did then, jazz performance. Jazz performance, yeah. Uh, which we just talked about. And then right. we, here, here's the trip. You remember in the early days, our studio wasn't even really a studio. It was just like an office, hot lights, no control room. But we made right. that jazz anatomy thing happen. And then um, and then you got really, really busy. You got crazy busy, winning awards, touring all over the place, recording, written up everywhere. It took, I don't know, man, a couple, three years to get our schedules to mesh up again. And then we finally got you back and we did jazz chord punches, jazz trio comping, jazz song practice playbook, all in the new studio. What a, oh, and also and, in the jam, and we oh, did yeah. the, oh, in the jam. In, in the jam, killer. Um, yeah. So there is a remarkable catalog from not only you know, yeah, I can be gratuitous here because I love you, and because I'm really proud of the work. Okay, but there is if you play jazz, okay, or want to learn how to play jazz, the the way Mimi has structured kind of all of the components of this library, you know, one connects to the other. We cover just about every aspect of it. And, uh, um, you know, Mimi is a passionate and highly skilled educator on top of being a great player. So um, check that stuff out. It is, it's good stuff. Um, Mimi, do you want to play another tune? Oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Station break. Trivia question. How old was Mimi when she started playing guitar? Answer that. Click the link. You could win a $100 gift card and buy all of Mimi's stuff. Okay. Um, let's do some geo. I am always I always flip out about, you know, where people are coming from in the world to tune us in for these, you know, live broadcasts. Tommy, would you do the geo? Yeah, you got it. Um, so let's see. Mimi, today we have folks tuning in from all over the world. Of course, we have Ohio, uh, Cork, Ireland, Naples, Italy, Rome, Germany, San Clemente, California, New Hampshire, Puerto Rico, Iowa, Harlem, Netherlands, uh, Waterbury, Vermont, Hong Kong, Dallas, North Carolina, Manhattan, Tampa, representing Cincinnati, Dominican Republic, Netherlands, Argentina, Queensland, Australia, Calgary, Portugal, and the UK. Lots of is folks out all? there. Is that all? <laughs> no. Those There's are more. The people that cared to tell us where they're tuned in from. But think about that. That's like almost every continent, every time zone. What a community, you know, of, you know, just beautiful people around the world. And it never ceases to amaze me. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Mimi, three quick questions for you. Okay. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Perry Sar wants to know if those are flat wound strings you were playing on your signature guitar. The flat answer wound. to that, yes, they are flat wound. And Jason Carter wants. To, well, I love this. Am I right in saying I can hear Mimi humming to herself as accompaniment? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, not accompaniment, but talk about your humming. Oh, you know, it's 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 something that I've actually tried to wean myself off of. <laughs> um, it gets it, it got me in trouble when I recorded uh, one of my first albums because um, when I was doing my acoustic guitar, so I wasn't going right into the board or right into an amp. Uh, you know, the microphone is in, in the studio is near your acoustic guitar, and so it was picking up. I would get a great take of something, and the producer would say, "Wow, Mimi, that's a great take. There's only one problem." you're humming along for the entire time. And so it's sort of an, un, it's a unconscious thing that I do. I think partly it helps me breathe. And in a live setting, nobody can hear it, but you can hear it in, in different settings. So yes, I, it, I, I hum along, but I don't I know, know that I would, I, I agree with Brad. I don't know that I would call it accompaniment. Accompaniment no. is I have a great bass player and drummer with me. Yeah. Uh, 
humming along is its own uh, bag. <laughs> yeah, we've heard you hum quite a bit in our studio. So I love it, man. It's like almost like a scatting thing, you know? Um, well, I, I don't think Ella is shaking in her grave, but yeah. <laughs> Um, and another question from Brogue 3D, uh, even uh, he's saying, even as you play this amazing tune alone, I can hear the band swings. How do you achieve that? You talk about that in a lot of your courses about, you know, that you should be able to hear the changes. You should be able to hear the arrangement, even when you're playing single note lines. Talk to that a bit. Yeah, well, because everything, it's kind of like, this is going to sound kind of trippy, Brad, but it's almost like a back to the future. It's almost like a quantum physics kind of thing where all things are happening parallel. So, for example, uh, if I'm playing a tune like, um, you know, say I'm playing Autumn Leaves, you know, um, you know, um, I'm hearing the falling leaves drift by my window, you know, the autumn leaves of red and gold. I mm -hmm. see your face, the summer kisses, the sunburned hands I used to hold. I know the lyrics, I know the melody. And then when I go to play and I go to improvise, that's informing what I do. So it's mm -hmm. all sort of connected. And, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the person that wrote in, he can he was saying that they could hear the whole band. It's because when I'm playing, I keep a forward momentum. And I think it's partly from uh, being a drummer also, uh, it, you know, uh, and playing drums and having that background. So I try to keep the propulsion going. So when I'm... So you can almost hear it. So ding, 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 ding. You can hear the bass player in there as well. And so that's all sort of happening for me uh, simultaneously, but I'm glad you can hear it because I do. I try to create a feeling and I go back and forth between when I'm playing solo guitar from doing some bass lines, chords, arpeggios, and then single lines and doing it all together. So talking about acoustic guitar, I remember the first time his, you know, every, I, I pretty much have only yeah. heard you play like electric, right? And then I'm trying to remember the gig I was at, but you pulled out an acoustic and just blew me away. And we talked about, you know, we've got to do an acoustic thing, you know? Um, right. You have, oh, you know, I did it, Brad. I did it at the end of the, well, I did it some in one of the new courses we did because I did some, uh, yes. some samba type grooves and I had a, an acoustic guitar that I used for that. And then at the end of the True Fire Live, the last one we did, there was just a little uh, small tailor hanging out and I yeah. played a few numbers on that, which was really fun. Did you play the Blue Tailor? Was it my uh, blue tailor? No, it wasn't a blue tailor. It was a little, it was a small one. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You just released uh, This Bird Still Flies, didn't you? Yeah, they came out last year. And um, that's an all acoustic album. And I'm yeah. really thrilled to, um, some people know this, but um, it was chosen as one of the best albums of the year by Downbeat Magazine. And um, so that, and San Jose Mercury News as well. So, you know, I've gotten a lot of nice, uh, nice press on that album. And it means a lot to me because I, uh, like Adam was saying, uh, and that's how when Adam Levy and I first connected as friends, we both share a love of many styles of music. But one of the things we love is, is old blues and old acoustic and folk music and Americana. Mm -hmm. And so um, acoustic guitar is just, you know, it's very close. It's close to my heart. So, yeah, it, well, it's amazing stuff. And I can't wait to hear a collaboration between you and Adam. That would be just spectacular, you know? Okay. So you've got your baritone there. Tell us about the guitar. Yes. I'm going to, well, this is actually a friend of mine. Uh, so this is also a Taylor baritone. And it's just got a really funky. I recorded um, uh, you know, I recorded um. I actually recorded Day Tripper on it on my recent uh, acoustic album, my own sort of jazz arrangement of Day Tripper, cool. and um, you know, so uh, it's just got a really funky, cool sound. Play us something. All right, so this is. I think I'm going to do, um, this is one of my favorite uh, 
favorite old kind of bluesish pieces. This is called Willow Weep for Me. And um, and yes, for um, uh, I know people are going to wonder what I'm doing. I am using artificial harmonics. So we'll see what comes out on it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, a comment I have to read you from Jason Carter. He says, okay, sure. how, how long can Mimi keep up that intensity of playing before her hands give out? And I can testify that the answer is forever. I've never seen your hands wear out. Um, Mimi, no. thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. It's great to see you, you know. Oh, it's great to see you too. I feel bad for the little technological stuff that happened, but hopefully uh, people got most of it. Well, based on what I'm seeing in the chat, which you'll be able to see late, uh, later when if you repeat this thing, um, people were thrilled. Tons of thumbs ups. Um, there is, uh, you know, we, we gave you the link to Mimi's catalog on Truefire. Go there, check those courses out. At, at the very least, favorite Mimi so that you can stay in tune with everything that she's doing. Um, go check out her uh, website. Uh, tells you everything that's going on. Go pick up that acoustic album. You will not be disappointed. And do not stream it. Buy it. Buy it, and then you can stream it. But buy the album, for God's sakes. And um, uh, Mimi, do you, you know Stu Ham? I, I know. I know you. Stu not as well as I wish I did. Stu and I have both. Uh, I think we shared the stage together once at All Star Guitar Night down That's at right. Nam, Anaheim. Yep. But it was a, it was just a little snippet. It was only enough for me to know that he is a, a really great musician. That I will. That I will tell you. Just to, you know, that, some, you can usually tell if someone has it within a few notes, and Stu clearly has it. So, yes, I he, do it better. He, I was saying, I was. We we had some emails before when we were setting this up today with Adam and Stu yeah. and myself, and um, uh, I was saying I I can't wait for the time that we can all play together again. So. Um, I know, and you guys are, you know, you're all out there very close to each other, and yet, you know, not and so And yet close. so far away right, <laughs> right now. As they say, alone but together, right? Yes. Exactly. Mimi, thank you so much. I thank hope we talk soon. Um, uh, stay safe, stay sound, stay healthy. Give my best, and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, Brad, you too. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, Stu, where are you, man? Stu, you got to unmute, man. One sec. Hang tight, guys. I see him there in a little window. I see him there. Yeah, we're waiting on him. We're just not getting audio from him. Um, switch switch to his video. We can do sign language. <laughs> well, there is the dude. Let's see if we can get some sound from him. Hang on. Holy uh, mackerel! Look at that background. I know, man. I'm gonna. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna roll. <laughs> it's <amazing. laughs> It's beautiful. Let's roll a clip of Stu, a video, and uh, I'll. And call while you're doing that, okay, yeah, we'll cool. Get, we'll get it sorted out, guys. So All right. I, here we go. go.
It's getting good. All right, we got Stu. Stu is back in the house. Let's see what Stu. we got. All right, we can hear and see Stu. What's How happening? are you, man? Man, I'm doing great, Brad. I was supposed to actually be in your studio right now. That's right. I know. And you know what the the drag is? You know, you you always say I don't save enough, you know, boat time and fishing time for you. And I had planned for you a full four day fishing adventure <laughs> yeah. on the boat. Uh, yeah. It was going to wine and dine you and overcome all of your future you know, comments about me. That, that's so easy to say now that I'm 3,400. It is. Like, play, it, exactly. Know, I can get away with it. So actually, I, I think my flight was, was at 7 a.m. like tomorrow morning. So I anyway, know, man. it's wonderful so, to see you and then happy to be here. Oh, the same, man. I, um, the thing I think about, you know, when I think about you is, you know, you, you and um, Danny Gottlieb were the house band for the all-star guitar night concerts we would give you know, twice a year, summer NAM, winter NAM, and the big room, standing room only audiences. We'd, we'd feature 12 to 15, you know, major, you know, artists, guitar players. And um, you and Danny, <laughs> and I still don't know how you did it. But the thing that blew me away is, of course, I, I know you as, I knew you, I should say, as the rock you know, the rock bass player. I knew you as the guy that, you know, invented slap tap, you know, and all that kind of modern bass stuff. And um, we had uh, Andreas Oberg. I don't know if you remember this, okay? But, yeah. you know, from Sweden, killer, just killer jazz guitar player. And he wanted to do, and you guys didn't have any rehearsal time. He wanted to do Cherokee, a really upbeat and in some weird key. And in my head, I'm going, oh, my God, this is going to be a train wreck, you know. Um, and you just were amazing. Like, it was like, and I came to, remember, I came to you after, and it's like, man, you're a really good bass player, you know. It was, it just blew me away. And I've come to know you, of course. We'll show everyone the catalog of work. Stu was also one of uh, the first artists that we work with that you know took took a shot with us even though what we were doing at that time was a little kind of weird and and new um and uh, if you could scroll through that catalog you'll see what was our first course together it was Stu you base basics was that the first one Stu I mean boy it that would be logical to think that's the first one we did and I, I guess it was um yeah but we we have covered, man, if you just, you know, we're showing on the screen, you yeah. know, tap, solo bass, rock bass, blues bass. You did a killer uh, beginning bass course. And over the years, you know, I've come to, you know, really appreciate how, you know, how, how deep you are musically, but also how passionate and good you are about education. And, you know, you come from a, you know, uh, a, a very musical family. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I did. I mean, if you go to my uh, Facebook page, I think it was um, it was two days ago, actually, it would have been my father's uh, 95th birthday. And I posted a little bit about him and actually his obituary for the New York Times. He was, uh, he was the president of the American Musicology Association, but really what he's best known for is um, uh, taking the study of popular music uh, serious at an academic level. And mm -hmm. he wrote a couple of books called uh, Music in the New World and Yesterday's a History of Popular Music in America. So uh, next time you read a scholarly paper on, you know, Eminem or something, I guess you can blame my dad for uh, legitimizing uh, the academic study of popular music. And, and he was a composer and uh, a sports fan and uh, a card player and uh, a literature lover and uh, a good man and my best friend that I, I miss him every day. I know. Poker. He played poker. He played poker with John Cage. In fact, one of the pictures I have is him and uh, and John Cage. Uh, so you got to realize that I grew up around, you know, uh, you know, picking the little plastic army men and putting them between the strings of a piano at Cranach <laughs> Center for John Cage to play his prepared piano pieces. And my, my best friend growing up, Chris Johnson's dad, 
uh, Ben Johnson wrote microtonal piano pieces where he had a uh, piano that had 19 notes per scale, not 12. And, uh, oh God. you know, non June Pike and all this, you know, early avant garde um, stuff. In fact, I was, you know, doing a lot of reading. There's a great novel called Overstory by Jonathan Powers, the one that Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago. He has mm -hmm. a wonderful book called Orpheo that's about. Um, music and at one point he actually references my father and the music department at the university of illinois uh and the work they were doing there so yeah it was i was exposed to everything uh, my mom was an opera singer and i have an older brother who played uh guitar until he moved to india to study sarod so you know i mean everything from jazz to classical to pop to rock was all was always treated uh with an equal sense of importance and i was exposed to so many different kinds of music it was just it was awesome well, um, I'm sure your father was and still is very proud of you, man. You're just amazing in so many ways. Um, let's kick things off. Play us something. Okay. Here is, um, uh, this is an old English drinking song that was popularized by Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> You know, I've actually never even asked you this question, but, um, you know, you're the innovator of, I guess, what people might call, you know, modern bass playing, you know, the slap and tap techniques, solo bass. How, how did that start? What gave you the notion to slap, tap, you know, on bass? Where, where did that you come know, from? I mean, the, the, the bass is really electric bass is barely over 70 years old and you know like everyone else i just I, I i listened to people that came before me and stole as much as i could um but that sort of time of the late uh you know middle 70s 80s you know bass just exploded because i i literally learned how to play bass uh playing upright bass uh walking through jazz changes in my uh junior high school jazz band uh and it was a couple years until i actually played you know, rock music, and I obviously played piano and lots of classical music for a long time. Um, but so, you know, growing up listening to, uh, you know, melodic bass players like Paul McCartney, uh, John Entwistle, and, um, you know, uh, people that played bass, but, you know, had a little more of a, a distinct tone and played a little more melodically. And then, like, the whole scene exploded because here comes, you know, Alfonso Johnson, and then here comes Stanley Clark. Um, you know, and then here comes Jaco Pastorius, who who just changed the game for everybody. He did to bass like what Hendrix did to guitar. And 
you know, playing playing uh, piano, I always love to hear, you know, one person play an unaccompanied instrument. You know, Glenn Gould is my favorite. I listen to him about every day. But I'd never thought of the bass as a solo instrument because, you know, the bass was a, a walking bass line. And after I saw Jocko, I mean, all bets were off. So I went and I started to try to work on some of my, um, you know, piano repertoire to uh, translate to bass. And that was Gershwin's Prelude Number 2, and I could play the beginning. But middle, there's a part where it, it's a C sharp and the and the, the melody lines contrapuntal, and I I you know couldn't forget how to play it and um, <laughs> you know I'd met Steve Vai when we were in 1978 freshman at Berkeley and and that's when Eddie Van Halen was you know playing Eruption you know <laughs> right all that nonsense but if you think about it you slow it down and. So instead of taking two hands to, to play one note, one to fret it, and one to pick it, if you just tap down on it, then the other hand's free to do other things. So I could play it, and I want to work on, um, you know, other classical pieces. So obviously, you know, people were slapping, not that many people, Larry Graham and upright bass players have been slapping forever, but you know, the whole bass world just changed. Um, and then I heard Jeff Berlin. So I was just one of the first guy to get to some of the, the using tapping in, in that way. But the amazing thing to think about is that, you know, when I was 16, you know, no one really played that way. And now a young bass player starting out has to learn how to slap a little bit. They got to play chords. They got to understand harmonics. They got to do a little tapping. And literally none of that technique, you know, existed when I was a kid growing up. So it's just, that's how quickly stuff is changing. And I feel, uh, I feel, you know, happy and honored to be part of, uh, of the lexicon, maybe part of every, uh, you know, future bassist DNA in a way. And then, you know, the bass soloing, you know, just, just making music, you know, melody, rhythm on the bass. Where, what inspired you to do that? Well, again, like I never thought of, um, you know, for me, bass is, you know, Killer Joe, you know, it's a walking bass line. That's what, what it does. And I'll show you real quick why the bass is the most important instrument in any band, right? It's because mm -hmm. it, it unites the harmony and the melody, right? What do people dance to? Mm -hmm. Right? And if you ever get paid to play this, then you win, right? That's yeah. really the point. But so if you've got a, someone playing the notes C, E, and G, and I play a C, it's a major chord, and everyone's happy. Now, if they play the same three notes, but I play an A, oh, it's a minor seven, and everyone's sad. So, you know, I have the power in that finger to decide <laughs> If a room full of people feel happy or sad by moving it like, you know, two frets. So <laughs> that's, that's, very that's cool. the cool thing about a bass. Um, how about playing something else for us? Yeah, man. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go out of the box here. This is a, you know, I did this record called um, The Diary of Patrick Xavier. And, yes. <laughs> and as far as you talk about, you know, obviously when I saw Jocko, um, you know, I never thought of the electric bass as a solo instrument. And he changed that game for everyone. So, um you know, when you're trying to play a piece or a solo piece, a lot of what I do is interpretation. It's not like I'm soloing over giant steps, you know, and so it's sort of the same notes, but how you phrase it and dynamics change the way you feel about it. But for me, every song I write is about something, you know, I'm trying to tell a story. And if the story you, you're you trying to tell is, look how fast I can play E minor funk, you know, unless you're Mark King, that gets, that gets old pretty quick, right? So, but no one ever asks me, what these songs are about. So in the album Diary of Patrick Xavier, for every song, I included a picture about where I wrote it and a little short story about why I wrote it and what it's about. So this is uh, called County Road, and it's about this crazy night I spent uh, at a guy's ranch in uh, southern Texas before a solo bass gig at a place called The Rear Window. Uh, anyway, and it's called County Road. That goes like this. Cool. Thank you. 
It's about night at Texas. Beautiful, man. <laughs> I'll tell you, there was, you know, um, for, for me, you know, there was a time when, you know, I couldn't even imagine, uh, you know, going to a concert and just a bass player doing a solo performance, you know. And, Absolutely. you know, you, there were many decades where bass players would take solos during, you know, a concert or something and largely you know, maybe a little self-indulgent or whatever, but, you know, I couldn't imagine sitting through a whole night. And I remember the first time I went to one of your concerts and you just did a whole solo bass set. It really was, or I have to tell you, it was, you know, it was so big for me. And, um, the, the music was phenomenal. The whole presentation was phenomenal, but you, you didn't feel like you were just watching a bass player take a solo and that's really uh something very very special i, well, I, I hope think so. thank you, you i mean bring one, to the table one, one thing i worked on is you know is being able to play and and talk at the same time and make it look easy right and then yeah. i can do about an hour and a half of continuous uh, storytelling and play. <laughs> but, uh, I know it. no the, the the idea is to make it um is to use these techniques you know, to 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 have more interesting vocabulary to tell a more interesting song. Because as I heard someone say that if the the virtuosity of the musicians becomes the point of the music, then mm -hmm. that's gonna sort of alienate anyone but the most hardcore, you know, jazz freak or, or anyone. And and I, you know, part of some of my favorite musicians are the Marx Brothers. I mean, they're technically amazing, but they're entertaining, right? right. And uh, there's nothing wrong with making people happy and entertaining them. Right. A couple of questions for you. Um, so I'm trying to, I, I don't have his name, but the question was, uh, oh, it's from Eric. Uh, wants to know how you got the Joe Satriani gig. How I met Joe was, 
uh, I had been playing with Steve Vai, and I moved to California to record the uh, Flexible record and Flexible Leftovers, and that uh, eventually got picked up by uh, Relativity Records. Uh, a guy named Cliff Culturary signed him, and I had been doing these solo bass shows at a place called At My Place on Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica. So they came down to see me play, and they liked it, and they, they said, can you do a, a, you know, a solo record? You know, and I said, well, you know, sure, if, you know, give my mom a copy and you let me sign away the publishing for my first five records for my whole life. <laughs> and uh, I think they literally gave me three thousand dollars to do the record. And I, I quickly ran out of money. And I, I had a, a song called Flow My Tears that I actually played in that video you played there uh, where I wanted the melody to be played by a muted trumpet like a Miles Davis thing. And the drummer on the record, Mike Barcimano, was playing with Mark Isham, who's a wonderful trumpet player, got him the tape. He loved it, agreed to play in it, but he wanted to record it at his home home studio and he did 50 bucks to pay his engineer. And I didn't have 50 bucks. And I don't mean I didn't have $50 in my recording budget to allocate for a secondary recording engineer. I just, you know, I was so broke. My bass was in and out of pawn shops on Van Nuys Boulevard and I didn't have 50 <laughs> bucks. So I called up the guys at Relativity and I said, man, I, I need a solo and I ain't got no money. <laughs> and they told me that they had just signed um, a friend of Steve Vai's uh, another guitar player, Italian American, whose name ends in I, Vi, Satriani, Gambali, mm -hmm. the list goes on and on. And uh, if I agreed to do some gigs with him, that he would play on my record. So I flew to San Francisco when he was in Hyde Street Studios, um, and he played brilliantly on that record. And I think back, you know, the first song I ever recorded had Alan Holdsworth and Joe Satriani both on guitar. Mm. I should have just quit while I was ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the famous story is how. Uh, you know, the audience would, you know, all of stew and they, you know, what, tell that story. They think they thought they were booing, but it was really, they were stewing, right? People still do that. I still, I still get that. Why, you know, uh, I think we were playing one of the times we were playing the Beacon Theater in New York and, and Joe's mother, bless her heart, was there. And she said, <laughs> you know, I thought the young man played very nicely. Why were they doing it? And, and he, it used to bug Joe, you know, and, and I, before one tour, he he uh, he tried to do this Internet thing where let's all chant ham, 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 ham. But, you know, when when large groups of Americans get together, remember that? Remember large groups of Americans getting together? Yeah. Large right? groups of any kind, yeah. Right. I remember that. And, and they consume alcohol. They like to go, ooh. <laughs> so, you know, Bruce Springsteen or Moose, you know, the old running back for the Cowboys. So uh, it became that. But to this day, people still, uh, people still don't get it. Bless their hearts. I I know. I think it's great. You got another tune. Save sure. one, one of my favorites is... Yeah. You know what one of my favorite tunes is, right? Going oh. to. Going oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can end with that for sure. Yeah, end with but that. The, Let's, don't oh, do okay. that yet. I, one, I won't do that one yet. This is uh, this was a uh, suggestion for Brian Dunn. Brian, thank you. He's one of my many students. Um, you know, like everyone else, this lockdown has had me spending, you know, a lot more hours and, and uh, you know, Zooming private lessons. You can obviously sign up at stuham.com. Uh, I taught Brian for ages and he's really come along, man. It's really incredible to see, uh, you know, people that I've worked with for a year, how, how much better they're getting and competent and everything. So mm -hmm. uh, he suggested that I play the song called The City. And the story behind this is that, um, of course, I'm a big fan of Bernard Herman, you know, the film scorer who did um, a lot of, you know, most of most best known for his work with Hitchcock. Um, you know, used a lot of Wagnerian ideas for his film scoring. But sort of one of his techniques was, you know, using a single melody without a whole lot of harmonization on it. Uh, and so, um, you know, I lived in San Francisco for 20, 20 years. And, you know, there's the Twin Peaks Tower uh, up there on top of Twin Peaks. And I was looking at that and I just imagined what kind of soundtrack Bernard Herman would write if he was writing about San Francisco. So this piece is called The City as per the request of Brian Dunn. Cool.
couple of shout outs you have uh ariana cap and steve jenkins fellow bass players Woo! tuned in and watching uh, rob favorite. garland i don't know if you know rob he's out by in your neck of the woods there you should hook up with him um and adam levy who opened the show is still tuned in oh i love uh, that do, yeah do remember, remember, that, remember, that, remember that evening or the, there was something something Limo leaving uh, Anaheim. That's right. You remember uh, that? Mexican, yeah. Barely a Mexican restaurant in downtown LA. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Remember. And then and then uh, Adam. And took I love, I love the, Adam, even though he just put out a record without a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to talk with him about that. You know, he took us to that speakeasy. Do you remember that too? After oh, the uh, that was incredible amazing. dinner, went into this love place in place. LA, kind of just. You know, it looked like an empty restaurant. And then we went to the back and this paneled wall kind of opened up and it was jam filled with people drinking scotch and gin and just Remember those me. giant ice cubes they had their thing was every drink had like a giant <laughs> I know, uh -huh. I know. I, I, love love great, that. Man. That I, I don't I remember love anything that. after that spot though. Do you guys? <laughs> oh, man, I have video, Tommy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Um, let's, uh, you know, we have a trivia question for you too. Tommy, why don't you, t uh, share, uh, Stu's trivia question with the audience. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, who played guitar on the recently aborted Stu Ham band EU tour in 2020? That is the question. Very, uh, very famous guitar player. See if you can find that info. Make sure you put that in uh, the link to the trivia, not in the chat. Hit it up. And and the hint we'll give you is all of the all of the answers to all three of these questions. We're giving away three hundred dollar gift cards can Woo! be found on these artists' websites. Amazing. And really, the whole point of this thing is to get you over to their website so that you connect with them because these are people you want to be connected with. Um, we're going to have time for a couple more questions. So if you have any questions for Stu, Ariana, I'm sure you can come up with a good question. Steve, <laughs> you probably could too. Give us something. Give it, you know, give us a really hard question for Stu Ham. Okay. The hardest you can come up with. And we'll ask it. How about while they're doing, while they're thinking that through, Stu, you play some, tell us a story and, and play us the story. All right, this one, uh, let's play something up. This is just, um, so, you know, when, when you have to play solo bass, you got to come up with ways to make it sound like more than one person playing. This is, I remember seeing a lot of people do this. I, I really miss Muriel's All-Star Guitar Night, playing with, with Danny and getting to play with so many people like Andreas Olberg and mm -hmm. Mike Orlando and, you know, all the great different people I got to play with, you know. Um, was was just amazing and the best part was the the first part of that show was pretty much acoustic and i got to just sit back on saturday night at almost the end of nam and just listen to great music and then you'd always got me a nice table and it was mm -hmm. wonderful but so so if you're playing a song right you just start out with just a bass line right 
that's that's really all you need, right? But say you wanted to add drums, you can add like snare on two and four, right? You can add a hi hat. From my Bohemian brother uh, uh, Steve Miller. Um, the audience always loves a little gear segment. Tell us about your bass and maybe some of the other basses I see in your background there. Oh man, very oh, artfully. Are those artfully displayed or just strewn about the pad? No, man. I don't want Tommy to kick my ass. I had to dress the room <laughs> a little bit, you know. What I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, no, you know, being uh, obviously one of the let's look on the bright side. One of the benefits of this lockdown is is you know upping my technological skills. Finally, Brad. Yeah, thank you. I know, I know. And, uh, I know. So you know, I've gotten used to to doing this. Is a wonderful uh, Warwick Triumph upright acoustic bass that I that I, I goof around. I put on standards on you know I real B and uh, and try to play along. Uh, here is one of my favorites. Uh, I was the first person you know, to have a Fender signature bass. Thank you very much. The original mm -hmm. Fender urges were short scale, like this guy over here, but this is an urge too uh, that's fretless, and I have the flat wound uh, tape, the, I mean, the nylon tape strings on it that gets a really incredible, incredible sound on it. And um, right now I'm playing these Warwick basses that, um, you know, I, people have been telling me about Warwick for a long time, Steve Bailey and a bunch of other people. And, um, I went and met Hans Peter Wilfer and most importantly, Marcus Spangler, who's the uh, wood whisperer there. And they had this incredible, you know, carbon neutral plant there in Germany and fine German engineering and everything's clean. And, you know, all the wood is sustainably farmed and they have aged outdoors and they have, you know, lists of where the wood is from. And they basically have this big machine. It's like, remember those, um, I know there's a name for it, but those models you make where you drop in a, um, a a BB pellet and it ends up kicking a ball that ends up, you know, doing all these things. Basically, you put it in a tree and it comes out a bass neck, you know. And um, he is just designed these wonderful basses. A lot of Warwick basses are more like metal basses, sort of neck heavy. 
And um, so when we designed this one, obviously I wanted it to be a little more ergonomically designed, you know, because uh, because of sort of some of the health issues that I've had, I'm a real champion for uh, the physical aspects of playing bass and warming up and stretching and yoga and all that kind of stuff. We could do an hour on this. It's just so important. It's something that people just don't talk about or teach enough, and I think it's criminal. Um, so this is this is a wonderful bass, and it's it's just the neck. I recently had it sent in for like an oil change because it was just beat to crap. And um, I know it's I don't know why you know it's called Banner, um, even though it has a Captain America sticker on it because it used to have <laughs> it used to have a Hulk sticker on the back. That's what a good uh -huh. guy it is, but it wore off. Um, and the neck, this bass is just great. I've been using EMG pickups, you know, since like 1980, and I got to be good friends with Rob Turner and Tommy Armstrong that worked there. And you know, um, I'm just so lucky. And GHS, man, I've been using GHS strings longer than the current president of the company has been there, Russ. Back when Russ's dad was worked there, so mm. uh, you know, I've always been involved with the industry side, and I'm, I'm just so fortunate to have that. And you know, I've got a new signature bass out with uh, from Mark Bass. It's like a more rock bass for there. Most of their players are sort of like fusion post jocko players. This has a solid state and um, tube side that I use a lot. You know, a lot of what I do is, is home recording, and you can um, find the rates for that on stewham.com. I just did one this morning, uh, a song called May I Invite You from this German guitar player. And, uh, you know, in that, I have a splitter. So what I can do is I can record a direct signal, and then I go into this isolation cabinet that I have, um, and then I use mostly when I'm recording like that, I use the tube side of it so that the client has a choice between a clean DI sound and a more of a, a crunchier tone like that. Um, and this is an interesting bass. This is, um, I was in Warwick for a while. I mean, Washburn and I, I played them, but you know, I could also talk for about an hour and a half about tuning and the fallacy of tuning and how out of tune everything is and what a myth it is. It's like money and countries. It's just a shared illusion, you know, a lie that we all agree to accept so we can function as a society. But this space is that this space is actually in tune, right? And when you play it, it's just God, it just makes you feel really, really good. Uh, you can't play it with other people because we have just gotten used to accepting the out of tune. So I'll give you a short display. So this space is in tune, right? And People used to say, oh, the harmonics are out of tune. Well, why would, you know, something occurring naturally in nature be out of tune? Wrong, right? God, don't make mistakes, right? So check it out. There's the third. Right? Now, here is what we have decided to agree is a third. You hear how sharp that is? I mean, it, it's not even close. Like, don't don't get me started, Brad. I will be here <laughs> but in this bass, man, when you play that, you know, that third, that major third, and you play the, the chords, it's just so incredibly beautiful in tune, and it, it makes your body and your soul relax and feel good. And, and um, so that's when it's a company called True Temperament out of Sweden, and uh, they're awesome, and I love them. Very cool. I see a couple or at least one acoustic bass back there. Do you have occasion to play that a lot? I do. This is, um, okay. Favorite thing I did when I was with Washburn was uh, design this wonderful bass, uh, acoustic bass. And, uh, you know, when most people have acoustic basses, there's, it's not an adjustable or intonatable bridge. They just have the bone nut around there, right? But if I can't raise the, you know, the action of each string individually or intonate it so that, you know, a G on the third fret is in tune with a G on the 15th fret, mm -hmm. then I, I can't play my solo stuff on it. So mm. uh, fortunately, unfortunately, one of the reasons we found out why people haven't done it before is because we had to put a block inside the body to mount the bridge on. But with the piezos in it, man, I, I've used this bass on more recordings than um, you would realize because it doesn't really sound like, you know, an acoustic bass. It has a really thick, it's wonderful, wonderful for recording. Acoustically, it's not as loud as some of the other, like, you know, Washburn acoustics that I have that are wonderful. But uh, it's just a different sound of the arsenal, you know. And when I'm recording, obviously, you want to use whatever is necessary. There's the tone that I use, you know, when I'm playing solo. But when you're recording, 
you know, some people are going to want a P-based sound. Some people are going to want it to sound like it's doing SVT, you know, ultra compressed. There's a reason, you know, why people use the same sort of sounds often because they work and, and where it slots into the mix. So it just gives me more options when recording. Awesome, man. Um, here's your question of the day. And if anyone can answer this question, it's you. The question is, what is groove? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> uh, three. How's that? Uh, boy, hey, my gro groove is the great intangible. Groove is the thing you can't you can't teach. You know, I don't want to sound like Jeff Berlin here. You can you can work on it, man. I mean, if you ever go, I encourage you to go to uh, a Stanton Moore clinic. You know, and uh, have him play sissy strut and and let you hear the difference between playing on the beat, playing in front of the beat, and playing behind the beat, right? And every drummer has got a different feel. You know, some drummers play hands, uh, you know, hands down. Some drummers play feet up. Um, and it's just so different, man. Uh, the, you know, Jeremy Colson, who I've played with, who plays with Vise um, Band. The first time I met him, we were doing a record for... Um, uh, Michael Schenker, and um, we were uh, faking like we were playing live for a photo shoot, and he counted off the song, and he went, one, two, three, four, and I could tell that he just had such a laid-back beat. I swear, it's impossible to explain, but like you could play the same tempo, like say 110 or 120, and the way different drummers play it, even though it's in time, the, it will feel completely different. Some people will be on top of it and everything's nervous. The rock drummer like like Jeremy, it's so far behind the beat, it physically makes things easier for me to play. It feels slower, even though it's the same tempo. So groove is just knowing like where to place the note. It's so hard to, to teach younger people or Germans, you know, how that there's more, <laughs> to, there's more to music than playing the right notes at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you hear, you know, uh, classical musicians try to sing popular song, <laughs> right? And, and, and when you hear someone like, um, you know, Billie Holiday phrase a melody and know how to keep it behind the beat. So, and, and then you hear someone like, and people will say, oh man, you know, that's easy. Well, if you play it dismissively, then it's gonna sound awful, right? And you hear someone like Lee Sklar or Nathan East that just know exactly where to that makes the whole song sound incredible. And that, that's what the groove is, I guess. That is a great answer. So um, let's show people, Give uh, Tommy, can we show the catalog one more time? Yeah, yeah. We were just this taking a look at the solo course. An incredibly comprehensive um, catalog of instruction uh, across a variety of styles, techniques, True that. Uh, different approaches, levels of play. Um, if you're a bass player, and I I even if you want to learn how to play bass, and one of the yeah. things that's not lost on me is, you know, uh, I, Stu, you may have even told me this, you know, if you want to become a better musician or a better guitar player, learn how to play bass and understand what's happening on that side of the fence, right? Absolutely. Look at, look at this catalog. I mean, we cover everything. We've been working on this now for, gosh, a long, long time, many, many <laughs> years. And um, we were, we did have a, a session scheduled. What were we going to do today, Stu, if the world didn't fall apart? Well, we were going to do uh, two, the, two, the 25 slap courses. Uh, yeah. That I'm, I'm just waiting to record that. Uh, a guitar player is... Um, very law-abiding citizen who's not willing, you know, as maybe you probably should, to uh, leave his home for us, the three of us, to get together to track. So 25 slap basses. And again, I got a great killer rhythm section of Joel Taylor, who, you know, played with Holdsworth and Yanni and everyone in L.A., more records than you can count as to get. Uh, uh, Guitar Hero did all those tracks. He's been in my band for, for ages. And uh, Dean Brown on guitar, who played with Billy Cobham and Marcus Miller and... Um, so the, and it's, it's going to be grooves too, right? So it's going to be teaching how to play yeah. these flat bass grooves, some, some easy, some hard, and also going to be some kick-ass grooves to jam along to. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't, this is a case where we could have 
you know, filmed it or I could have recorded it here and saved some money on the studio and sent it to them and do it. But that's that's not the idea. I mean, life is fun. And the reason I chose these guys is because I want to get in a room with Joel, who can read my mind musically, and Dean, who's a funky mofo there is, and whip these charts out on them. And they're L.A. guys and they can read, you know, fly shit on paper and have a go at it and make something happen for four minutes and have a hell of a good time and get that on tape. That's what that's all about. And the second tape was going to be about constructing walking bass lines. And uh, another one of my students, Jan Honef from the Netherlands, he's probably not listening because it's the middle of the night there. But uh, we just had a great lesson uh, last week about uh, creating walking bass lines. And I really got through to him. It was great to see a light bulb go off in his head about some ideas that I shared with him. So those are all mapped out and ready to go. Whenever the world opens up, man, I'm ready to go. And you got a pretty liberal governor. So Santos is like double, you know, professional wrestling pieces and <laughs> rhythm section shit. That's it, man. Uh, we're, we're next on the list. I'm sure about it. You are definitely at the top of the list. And uh, Stu's going to go ahead and get those things recorded. And we're going to do those courses together. And we're going to get them to you as quickly as we can. Um, Some great the trivia courses, though. The, the great, I mean, like I said, there's there's beginner courses, there's the specialty courses in slap and tap. Um, the, the fretboard fitness one is great, man. That is like just hardcore. I love playing scales and hand positioning. And it's just, you know, if you're serious about like learning the fretboard and harmony on the bass, if you can work from the beginning to the end of that one, that's great. And the other one is what's really great is the 50 grooves. I went to studio with Carver Hine and I, Bernie I Trent. love that. Yeah, Again, yeah. those are two of the L.A. top session players. And we just, you know, we recorded songs from a blues to a shuffle to a New Orleans thing to a 7-8, you know. And um, I show you how to play the bass line. Then you've got these killer tracks by, like I said, two of L.A. you know musicians that have been on more records than you can shake a stick at. You know, and so you cover killer. a whole bunch of different styles and feels. That's I mean, you really You're really equipping, <laughs> you know, if if you want to work, you're going to need to know these, you know, these bass grooves, these lines, these different styles. It's it's all there in this library. I'm very proud of this library. I don't yeah, I don't think too. there's any library of its kind on the planet. And and we've had, you know, we've been working on this over a decade. So thank you for that, Stu. Really oh, appreciate you, it. Yeah. And, I've been with you so long. I couldn't I couldn't find that. I had like four addresses. I had to mail something. <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't remember where the hell you guys were. Oh, and, and then lastly, uh, there, there are some real specialty courses, you know, more like beginner courses and yeah. punk bass and rock bass and blues bass and jazz bass, just more of like an intro. Um, and again, if you're a guitar player and you're interested in how to approach these style of the music, and, and they're all, I really try to mix it between, boy, I'm a big one on just practicing and the coordination mm -hmm. you need, but then you want to use that to immediately start playing along to songs. And so these all have play alongs. And, and a lot of different settings that are going to help you, whatever, whatever uh, style you're at, you're into. Yeah, and you know everything's tab notated, synced to the video. You can slow it down, you can loop it. Um, you know this is where you want to be if you want to get your you know your bass chops together. Um, we announced the trivia winners. Congratulations to the three of you, Tommy. Would Who you? Was? Would you, um, Tommy? Why don't you? Uh, announce everybody's names and tell us what the answers to the questions were. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can find the names while I'm doing that. I'm going to go ahead and give away the answers. I know for Stu's question, uh, wait a minute, I don't have it. Yeah, I can tell you the three I winners are, okay, you got it? Yep. So who played guitar on the recently aborted Stu Ham Band EU Tour 2020? Torsten De Winkle. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for Mimi's question, how old was Mimi when she started playing the guitar? She was 10 years old. Crazy. Woo! Crazy. Uh, and um, who, uh, what well-known Christmas song did Adam Levy's grandfather, George Weil, write? It was "It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year." That's wow. a big tune. That's Damn. a big tune. <laughs> you got the so, answers or the uh, winners there, Brad? Yep, the winners are P. Veroni one, Tog Vote. You know their usernames, so I'm mispronouncing <laughs> them. Uh, there, you know what? Ali put them in the chat. Better you just look there. Congratulations to you guys. Cop out. And the Cop out. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, how do you pronounce Procon 38? I guess like that. Or Tog Vognin. Yeah. Um, anyway, your $100 gift cards are in your account. Go buy all of Stu's courses. Go buy all of Adam's courses. Go buy all of Mimi's courses. And Stu, I've been waiting for this moment all week. I get to hear you play one of my favorite tunes, not just one of my favorite Stu Ham tunes, but literally one of my favorite tunes. I've listened to this a thousand times and never tire of it. Would you do us uh, the pleasure of playing us out with my favorite tune? I will. I'll, I'll, I'll preface, it, preface it by, you know, one of the amazing things about the quote unquote life I lead is that, you know, I've been able to, uh, travel to just so many amazing places you wouldn't believe you know i played in um in vladivostok russia with with greg howe and dennis chambers and uh you know i've been everywhere i spent a christmas on the galapagos islands and i've been to so many amazingly beautiful places uh but the actual my favorite spot in the world is a place called muir beach overlook and it's halfway between uh, the Pelican Inn uh, and Muir Beach and Stinson Beach uh, on the California coast. And there's a little outcropping you can go to and uh, you can see Twin Peaks, you know, uh, downtown San Francisco, one direction. And the headlands, Marin headlands on the other side. And I go there every chance I get. And um, it really is, man, that's where my heart's at. And uh, that's what I think about when I play this song by Led Zeppelin.
Wish I was there right now. Oh, beautiful, man. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your music, for your insight. We miss you. Um, miss you too, dude. Give my best to Allie have... and everybody over there. All right. I'll get that boat ready for you. <laughs> okay, man. All right, man. All right. Later. Thanks for everything, guys. Ciao. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.